are going to be in, um, you can go to the sermon slide, the picture, uh, Galatians uh, this morning. Um, the other thing we tend to do on Mother's and Father's Day is give a Father's Day sermon or a Mother's Day sermon and then kill everybody and send them home and they realize they suck as a father or a mother and, you know, um, and wish that they were and then they wish that Father's Day didn't come. So people actually avoid church on this day because they think they're going to hear about everything they're not. Um, and um, we're here to hear about everything he is and that's where we find our comfort uh, uh, this morning. So Paul, so this is uh, Galatians and um, I love Paul. Paul's a little heady at times, and we're going to work through uh, some of that. Um, I'm going to try to uh, talk about it, but he's really practical, and I found it really practical uh, this week. And so if I, um, if I uh, can communicate well, this really ministered to me this week, and, and, and it makes a lot of sense. It's like Paul like, lives in our homes, and he lives in our families, and he does life with us, and he knows the struggles we face. And um, he uh, does that, and uh, does that in Galatians, um, and uh, we're, we're here. Paul in Galatians, the whole book, and we're just jumping into it this morning, um, but later on, we're in Galatians 3 uh, this morning, but one of the themes of Galatians is, Paul actually uses this term, um, our tendency to fall from grace. Um, and somewhere along the line, that term has been kind of hijacked by our culture. And so if you were out in the community this week and, um, and, and um, were out and about and something had happened with me and you heard through the grapevine that that pastor down at Nature Coast Church... Brad, do you know Brad at Nature Coast Church? He's fallen from grace. You would immediately go, oh my word, what did Brad do? Now, maybe that has happened this week. <laughs> uh, in the community, it wouldn't surprise me. But you would say, what did he do? Because we've hijacked that term. And we immediately think, oh my, he must have done something really, really bad if he has fallen from grace. We have hijacked that term because that's not how Paul uses the term. He actually uses it literally. He is concerned that people who go to church, who people who are religious, their tendency... It's to embrace grace when it comes to their salvation and then immediately fall away from grace, to turn their back on grace. So in this particular letter to the church, he's usually meaning like you literally have fallen away from grace. And the way he kind of constructs that here in this letter is the minute you add the word, it's grace, but, you know, you got that button there then you've fallen away from grace. Because the minute you add to grace is the minute you've fallen away from grace. So in the vernacular of Nature Coast Church, the minute that you add something to nothing of the Jesus plus nothing equals everything, you've fallen from grace. You've literally fell away from grace. Because the only way grace works is if the nothing is there. That's the only way grace operates. The minute you add something, grace no longer ceases to be grace. And so that's kind of uh, the theme. Um, so the minute we add something to Jesus plus nothing equals everything, we have fallen uh, from grace. Remember a few weeks ago when I was in the book of Revelation, and again, you know, usually if, if you, know, you hear the word falling from grace, you're, you're thinking about those, those big... Um, big uh, ascends, but when I was in the book of Revelation, you know, when you look at the trajectory of Scripture, um, of, of Scripture, and, and you just see the language of, you know, Israel and the Old Testament kind of being the bride of Christ, and we are the bride of Christ, this kind of uh, love relationship uh, between uh, Christ and his people, 
Um, Jesus plus something I said a few weeks ago, if you add something, it's always adul adultery. It's spiritual adultery. Um, we've so defined adultery into a term that scripture takes it in a much far broader way. That anytime you pursue another lover, um, anytime you pursue something other than Jesus, um, the Bible actually calls that adultery. Um, and, um, and that's always the something. The something is something other than Jesus. And so that's going to be helpful as we come to this very wordy text. Um, so bear with me. Um, it's going to feel awkward as we go through this, not because it's so wordy, but again, what I will share will maybe even seem a little different to us. Um, but um, in Paul's language that he's doing uh, or that he uses in Timothy, uh, when he's writing Timothy in the book of Tim Timothy, Paul, as he writes us and he's writing this church in, in Galatia, he's wanting to train us, you know, for the word of God is profitable to train us in the righteousness of Christ. Um, and that's what he is trying to do. He's trying to train and teach us. And so this is a little teachy. Um, a little bit, but it is proclamation, and so we're going to do that. So I'm going to read just, I'm not going to read it all the way through, so stay on this slide first, and we'll just uh, spend time on this. But before faith came, and I know we're jumping in the middle of text, but I'm going to address that. We were held captive. We were held in custody under the law. Um, you have to jump into scripture. I'm going to try to explain um, that a little bit, but uh, you're held captive in the Old Testament and the Mosaic law, and this would go beyond just the, the Ten Commandments. But when you think of the word law here, you can also say, but before faith came, we were held captive by do's and don'ts, if you just want kind of a more common language. We were held captive by the do's and don'ts, and those do's and don'ts, they imprisoned us. They enslave us. Um, until the coming of faith revealed. Now, Paul is awkward and shocking here because he's actually talking about the Old Testament. Um, we even today get uncomfortable with that, but Paul is pushing us somewhere beyond um, maybe saying the Old Testament was leading us somewhere. Therefore, the law, the, the do's and don'ts were our guardian. Um, I have the word in there I want to explain in here. That's the Greek word, pedagogos so that we might be justified by faith. All right, that's a mouthful. So, before faith came, we were imprisoned by the do's and don'ts. We were imprisoned by our performance. And any time you are in custody and held captive by your uh, performance, you're in prison. That's still true today. If you want to live your life worried and based upon how you are doing all the time, you're in prison and you're slave. And I'm going to talk about that in a, in a second. Um, you're held captive to it. But Paul is saying something's changed. Um, the coming faith would be revealed. Now, he doesn't totally just dismiss the reality of the Old Testament, the reality of what God gave Moses on the mountains. He doesn't dismiss it. He calls the law, um, the best English word is guardian. Um, that's not the word he used. Um, some versions use schoolmaster, which is even worse than guardian. Guardian is at least trying to capture what it is. I'm going to talk to where I'm going next. So that... The law, actually, you want to know why the, all the laws, you know what, you know why, you want to know why the Ten Commandments were given to us? So that we would believe that Jesus plus nothing equals everything. So that we would be justified by faith. Paul is saying the only reason the Ten Commandments were given to us was so that we would be justified by Jesus alone and nothing else. They weren't given to us so that we would do better. They weren't given for us. The only reason the Ten Commandments were given to us is so that we would be justified by faith. And that's awkward for the church to say that. Because we think they were given for far more purposes and we kill each other. We're going to get to that in a second. So the law was our garden, our, our pedagogus. All right, so I'm going to talk about that. That word is a noun. Because in Roman culture, 
there actually was a job title called pedagogus. There was a pedagogus that could live in the home. And um, this pedagogus was usually a slave or certainly not a member of the household. This particular person, their entire role, and if you're like a school teacher or ever were a school teacher or you were um, um, in any kind of educational thing, you would have loved this person because this person was not the person that taught the kids, that taught the children. This person is the person that freed the teacher to teach. So this person was never, it was, there was a reason this person was outside the household because no one really liked this person. The kids didn't like this person. That's what a pedagogus was. It wasn't the teacher. And here was the job of the pedagogus. This was the job that this person in the house will do. I uh, will pick a Roman name, Festus. Festus is a little boy, and he's in the house. Festus has to go to learn every day from a teacher. Festus doesn't want to get out of bed in the morning. Festus doesn't want to listen when he is with the teacher. Festus doesn't want to pay attention. This particular person is the person that would just follow Festus around all day long. The teacher would never have to offer correction, ever at all, because of this pedagogus would be there. Festus, you're not paying attention. Festus, do your homework. Festus, you're daydreaming. I mean, it would go on and on. School is done. Festus would be on his way home, and he'd take a detour. Nope. No, Festus, you got to go this way. You're going right home. If the person who was this particular role did not do the teaching, that's not what this role was. So when you actually think about what the pedagogist means, I mean, honestly, I got to this later in the week. I'd have changed my sermon title. The pedagogus was like the mean babysitter. The mean babysitter who just always was telling you that you're doing it wrong and you can do it better. It's the conscience. It's that human being. So maybe we do in those little cartoons or whatever, and that little thing pops up in your head. You're always doing it wrong. You can do it better. Don't do it this way. Hope you're out of line. That's what Paul calls the law. The law was our mean babysitter. So that we would be justified by Christ. Because the law is always telling you you're doing it wrong and you could be better. And see, here is the enterprise of the church that Paul is going to shatter. We actually think that's the role of me. That's the role of the church. That you come and you hear me tell you how you're doing it wrong and how you're doing it better. I mean, literally, that's the idea of what church has become. I mean, we automatically, I mean, why don't we just name our churches? That's mean babysitter Presbyterian church down the road. That's mean, mean babysitter Baptist church down the road. Because that's why people think they come to church. That's why we think scripture is. And Paul is saying, no. No, the, role, the law, the, the rules of the do's and don'ts had a purpose, but that purpose and their one and only purpose was not to teach us. The purpose is that law always sits in our conscience and the law is always telling us we're doing it wrong so that we will just say, Jesus, 
Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. He's saying that before faith came, the system was rigged against you and me. It was rigged. And do you know, you want proof that it's rigged? I got one question for you. Did you wake up this morning? <laughs> Did you wake up this morning? It's already been rigged against you this morning. What am I going to wear today? Going to church. What should I wear to church? I wonder what so-and-so will think about what I wear to church. Should I wear this to church? What am I going to do with my time? Should I go to church at all this morning? It's Father's Day. Maybe my day is better well spent with the family. Oh, I went and did it to my family. Should I have gone to church? Maybe you should, maybe you should take my family to church. This is what it is. We woke up this morning. It has already gone through your conscience. Whether it's to come to church, whether it's what you're wearing. Um, and, and, and you know what? We, it is so rigged. There are p people here this morning that may be judging what someone else wore to church. It is so rigged in our system and we are so held captive in our conscience, we literally wake up and we wonder, should I have worn that to church? Should I have not worn that to church? Um, and then the church itself, because we're the mean babysitter, is telling you what to wear to church. We're the places in our conscience, um, you know, what should I wear to Walmart today? Do I wear something different to Walmart than to church? <laughs> I'm going to a wedding. What should I wear? I mean, we can't get away from this rigged conscience in our system that we're always wondering if we've done it right. That is the pedagogue. That's the pedagogue in our mind. Always saying, nope, don't wear that. Oh, okay, you, you can wear that. And, 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 and then the, the, the pedagogue, um, even when you're done thinking, well, after I was there, maybe I shouldn't have worn that. I mean, in religious world, this is how it goes. What do I do today? Well, do I go to church? But beyond, what do I do tomorrow when I wake up? Do I spend a half hour in Bible reading or do I only spend 15 minutes? Oh, I should have spent more time. I love sports. And the hockey were, or the, the lightning were terrible last night. I did not waste my time after the first period watching that thing. But will God love me if I, I spend this afternoon watching baseball? Because I'm not reading my Bible while I'm watching baseball. I mean, you just in your mind. It never leaves you. It's just there. Every, and you all know what I'm talking about. I didn't invite so-and-so to dinner today. I, I mean, it's just there. The minute... We wake up. We're trying to appease our conscience. In whatever way it is. And I've only mentioned to do what to wear, what to do, loving God. I'm not enough. I wish I was more. And then we take it out to others. I'm not enough. And if I'm not enough, then I'm going to make sure you know you're not enough. Because I, if I can prove that you're not enough, then maybe I will be a little more than enough than you're enough. I will never do that again. I will never make that same choice again. I promise I will never make that choice again. Then we do it again. And then we're so captured by this, we begin to evaluate our repentance. Well, I said I was sorry, but then I did it again. Was I really sorry? How do I know I was really sorry? Was I sorry enough? 
And then we have everyone else. We have the mean babysitters that we come to church with that telling you, well, you're not sorry enough. If you were sorry enough, you wouldn't have done that again. I mean, do you see the relentless horror that we live under? That just won't stop? It never stops. The things that we wish we'd never done and we can never undo. We've all done that. So we spend the rest of our lives trying to do the thousand good things to outweigh the one bad thing, but that one bad thing is always there, always condemning us, always reminding us, sitting in our conscience. We are relentless in our evaluation of ourselves. We're relentless in our criticism of others. And we do this because we believe the law actually came because God will love a future version of Brad better than he loves the current version of Brad. And that's what we believe the enterprise of the church to be. That God will love some future version of me more than he loves me right now. And that is tyranny. It is tyranny. And then, of course, living under that not only tears us apart internally, it tears us apart from each other. Your uneasy conscience actually might have brought you to church this morning. Your pedagogue, you need to go to church this morning. You need to go to church. You may have come here this morning hoping that I might deliver your conscience. But here's what Paul is saying is so foolish and stupid. Our consciences need delivered, so what do we try to deliver them with? The law. <laughs> your conscience is wanting deliverance and maybe you came for deliverance and conscience and, and you actually think that, that that person standing up front, he's maybe going to give you something to do that would just relieve your conscience. Or maybe he's just going to tell you that you've done something good enough like, oh, I, I just wasn't that bad. Oh, I thank God I'm not like that other person. I mean, we're just trying to appease our conscience. All of the uneasy consciences that came here this morning. You may think that you came here for me to deliver you some nugget of knowledge and truth that will deliver your conscience. But you know what your conscience is really wanting this morning? The forgiveness of your sin. That's what your conscience wants is the forgiveness of your sin. The law is always looking for Jesus. Always. We view it differently. We think we become a Christian. And becoming a Christian means becoming less and less a sinner and more and more a saint. And now I can give you the law, and with the help of the grace of the Holy Spirit, we'll do it better. I say this all the time, honestly. My goal up here is to kill you. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> to just destroy any ounce of inkling of hope that you have placed in your own ability to do anything. To kill yourself to kill your ego and give you Jesus. Paul is writing this to demolish and shatter any idea that the law can do anything to change you because it can't. It can't. So the question this morning is, is what are you trusting to deliver your conscience. 
See, here's the truth about all of the do's and don'ts, which I'll just use instead of the word law. Is the law, your do's and don'ts, never one time in all of eternity has the law ever forgiven you, ever. It just keeps telling you you're guilty. Not one time will the law ever be able to forgive you. In fact, usually the law says no forgiveness. That's kind of a negative thing. I'm going to close here. Um, you can stay on this slide, and then I'm going to go to the next slide. This is kind of worded weirdly. So if you have a Bible, you could do this. Um, I'm going to do it right now. Um, but every time you see the word faith in the text, Substitute the word Jesus, and I'm going to read it that way. But before Jesus came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming of Jesus would be revealed. Therefore, the law was our guardian so that we may be justified by Jesus. Next slide. But now that Jesus has come, we are no longer under that guardian. We're no longer under the mean babysitter. For we are all sons and daughters of God through Jesus. For as many as you have been baptized into Christ, have been put on Christ. And you go to this next slide because he's moving us toward freedom. Um, there is neither Greek, Jew, Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring Heirs according to the promise. Do not go to the next slide. That should not be in there. I need to delete that from last week. Um, Paul provides intervention. He says, We are heirs according to the promise. Paul's desire is not for that crazy, mean babysitter, that pedagogue. We're no longer under. We don't need the mean babysitter anymore. Because Jesus has come. And so we ask, can Jesus it's his promise of deliverance. See the truth is. I think the thing our minds struggle with is a lot of times my conscience is actually right. I'm not enough. I didn't do that well enough. I could have made a better choice. I wish I could take those words back. The question isn't whether that conscience is accurate or not. Paul's never even saying it's not accurate. He's asking the question, what are you seeking in the deliverance from that accusation. Are you asking for another set of rules that will finally free you from that accusation? Paul doesn't let us go there. He's saying your deliverance can only come through Jesus. Because I will live today and I will live tomorrow and I will still make poor decisions. I will still let things slip out of my mouth that tear people down. I will still not use my time wisely. And I can choose to become enslaved to another list of do's and don'ts. Or I could trust in the one who's done it all and freed me. Freed me and trust his deliverance. Paul wants to set us free. In Galatians 5, he'll say, stand fast in that liberty. But that freedom feels scary to us. It does. We just rather rest and find our hope to clear our conscience than something we could do. Are you telling me to just trust the promises of God? Paul actually in the text points us to our baptism. Like, 
Do you want your conscience clear today when you made that poor choice? Remember your baptism. You were baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Doesn't matter what mode it was, whether you got it as a baby or you did it as an adult, you were baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and that is who you are. You are the beloved son or daughter of the King, period. Is it foolish enough just to believe that, to clear your conscience? The Bible, or the gospel, Jesus says, is foolishness. And it's scary. One of Martin Luther's greatest works was his hymn, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. He has a verse in there. He was neurotic with his conscience. He writes this, we're not, it's rhetorical, it basically would say, is not the right man on our side? The man of God's own choosing. You ask who that may be. Ah, Christ Jesus, it is he. Lord Sabbath, Lord of rest is his name. From age to age, he's the same. And he has won the battle. A mighty fortress is our God. For your conscience and my conscience to set us free to love our neighbor. Because when our conscience is bound, we cannot love our neighbor. I mean, you want the tyranny of the conscience. How do I love my neighbor? Do I do it this way? Do I do it that way? Should you give money to that person or am I enabling that person? I mean, you just go on and on and on. What if Jesus has so freed you you just do what you do and you let him take care of whatever is happening and quit trying to play God and let him be God and trust him to deliver you, to deliver your neighbor through his love and through our love. The table is for everyone. You can't even come to church. I couldn't go to church growing up. Should you come to the table or should you not come to the table? <laughs> Here we go again. It's everywhere. It's screaming at you. Well, I don't know if I can go to the table. There's your conscience. I had an argument with my significant other this morning. I'm not sure God wants me to come to the table. I need to clean up. Well, let me forgive myself. But I, I actually had an argument the last time with my significant other came to the table. And then on the car ride home, I argued him again. So maybe I shouldn't come to the table this time. Because I wasn't sorry enough. I mean, do you see what we've done even to God's table? We bound the conscience. You ask if you're new here or you're visiting here. Who can come to the table? Anyone who just wants to meet Jesus. You say, well, I've never met Jesus before. We'll meet him this morning. This is his broken body. This is his shed blood for you. I would actually beg you, if you've never met Jesus, to come here this morning. Not go through some hurdle at some church to find out if you really cut the mustard. <laughs> through our own set of do's and don'ts. This table is for you. And actually, we say, well, well, what did Paul in 1 Corinthians said? You know, it seemed like he said, you need to be careful when you come. You know what he was saying? He goes, if you got the list of rules and don'ts, don't come. They're trying to bind other people's consciences. Examine yourself to see whether you believe in Jesus plus nothing equals everything. 
This table is for you. And I invite you to come and take it and experience his love and his freedom and love for him and love for others. The way we do it here is we do come. You can eat it when you're giving it up here. You can take it back to your seat. We don't all eat it together. You can pray. You can do whatever as Ali is singing. Um, but come, if you're helping serve the table, come um, up here. And uh, we would love you uh, to come. Not that we just sing that stuff and then take it all away by the end of the service. Well, it is for you, but mm, no, not really. See, here's the problem. We don't really trust the deliverance of Christ. Because here's the angst. Like, Brad, how are you going to get anyone to change their behavior with a message like that? It is scary. It is scary. Brad, are you telling me that the bloody cross and the resurrection of Jesus is enough? Yes, I am. Do we believe it? And it's a scary place to be because we don't really believe it. We don't really believe it. We don't believe it. Is it really enough? But the minute you believe you have something left to do, you're a slave. Because whatever that something is, you will never know if you're doing it good enough or done it right enough, ever. The minute that you believe there is something left for you to do, you are a slave. You're a slave. Under the tyranny of that. Later on in Galatians, Lori's going to be up here to pray. Oh, she's going to go left. I will allow her to do that. <laughs> we have both right and left here. So, yeah, that's good. Um, um, but uh, if you want to pray... You have something you want to pray out, something that's enslaving you, something that's bothering you, we would love to offer you Jesus um, in the midst of that. But Paul actually closes um, Galatians, talks about the fruit of the Spirit. And there's a whole list. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, all of those things. They're all fruits of the Spirit. They are fruits of the Spirit. That's what Paul says they are. But there's a line at the end that we treat as a throwaway line because he says this when he's done with the list. Against such, there is no law because the law cannot produce kindness. The law cannot produce long-suffering. The law can't produce not one fruit of the Spirit. See, I, I obeyed a rule there, right? I'm going to throw it all away. The law cannot produce not one damn fruit of the Spirit to get the point across. Only the love of Jesus can do that. Only the love of Jesus, and that is a scary place to be. The freedom that comes from just trusting that there's power in Jesus promised all of this and he doesn't lie go in peace amen